On our earth, before writing was invented, before the printing press was invented, poetry flourished. That's why we know that poetry is like bread. It should be shared by all, by scholars and by peasants, by all our vast, incredible, extraordinary family of humanity. That was Pablo Neruda. I'm Bob Holman. And this is the Poetry is Bread podcast, where poetry challenges us, makes us think, and with imagination and courage, changes the world. Today, we get to visit with New Yorican poet Victor Hernandez Cruz, who was born in Agua Buenas, Puerto Rico, high in the mountains where the Hebrews, the wandering poets, live and have their poems live as well. He lived in New York City for many years, self publishing his first book, Papo Got His Gun, when he was 17, a mimeographed chapbook which was distributed by sneaking copies of it onto the shelves at the 8th Street bookstore. His next book, Snaps, was published by Random House, a national phenomenon. Allen Ginsberg said, this is poesy news from space anxiety police age inner city, spontaneous urban American language as Williams wished, high school street consciousness transparent, original soul looking out intelligent Bronx windows. Well, since then, Victor has published over 10 books. Next one's out from Ishmael Reed's I Read Books. Gaia Khan, it's called, after the tree in the tropics. Vincent has been in Morocco for over 25 years. He has two children with his Moroccan wife, whom he met at a literary conference in Spain. Spanish is the mother tongue there in, in uh, Marrakesh, Morocco. His last book was Under the Spanish, and boy, it literally is, where Morocco is 15 kilometers south of Spain, and literally it is, because it's Spanish that the Taino language was lost to. We caught up with Victor Hernandez Cruz in Fez, Morocco. Here we are in Fez, Morocco. Bob Holman sitting here at the table with Victor Hernandez Cruz. We're going to take a poetry journey that began in Agua Buenas, Puerto Rico, came to Loisida, the Lower East Side of New York, and now we find ourselves in Fez with with Victor. How long have you been here, Victor? I think on and off for 20 years. When I came here, uh, Hassan Du was the reigning king, and uh, now his son is the reigning king. He passed away, and I called the last two years of uh, one year, year and a half of his reign, Mm -hmm. and... uh, uh, I've been here since, you know. That's right. You started to, you have a family here? And I have, my wife and I have two kids, and uh, <coughs> one is 18, my daughter's nine. And our family talks uh, Spanish, English, French, and Arabic, and our central language is Spanish, which everybody could, could, could understand Spanish. I understand most of the stuff that's going on in Arabic, and French is my worst language. So, uh, explain what's going on. We're well, hearing the call to prayer from the minaret, and that's uh, five times a day. They follow the stations of the sun, and uh, the, those five prayers are each day, each day, every day. Sometimes and they go into the night too. At three thirty in the night, so that you can hear a call to prayer. Not that nobody's going to go to the mosque at that time, but people, some people pray in their house. It sounds to me like this is the Mosaic. This call to prayer is is actually traveling through these small streets of of the uh, of the Medina, like we're uh, like where we're living here in Fez. It's a constant you know? background here for everything. Is the call to prayer, you know? And it's language is so it's pure Arabic, um, and it contains in it sort of the the essence of the air. It's a, a, a call to prayer. So, Victor, why don't we start our journey with a poem. What's this one called? It's called Sam. Sahara is a thought of my word. It has been an infinite fire stretching into the firmament meadows. Does the sand continue into the sky? We are less than what we thought. Hungry scorpion desert of your eyes. Laser beam from the stars are the clocks in the night sky. How they arrange themselves between the windows indicates that it is spring. Amazidi are free men and women, children of the wind. 
they are they have survived the Romans, the Latin knife, fish that came out of the sea as knives. Stay away from the square of their homes, of their houses. Stay streetless under the sky, the sky. close the tents circular upon the, t the sand. Cooking lamb within tangines in the desert, the horizon is our spice. Berber girls, Berber Amazidi girls are the most beautiful in Morocco. Necklaces of silver like curtains across their cheeks. They move shoulders and bounce buttocks like shaking jello through the red argon terrain. She, goats penetrate with all gods, a henna of geometry which is too immense to decipher. Process with the Ganawa rhythms, that's why from a distance I just count the sand pebbles jumping from the metallic castanets across the curvature of the sand dune where the only flowers are the colorful gelebas of the girls, waving, waving as they are eaten by infinity. Victor, how did it how did it happen? How did you find well, yourself here in Morocco? I, I was at a conference in uh, Spain, in uh, 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 Sevilla. Se, no, no, it was in uh, Madrid at the uh, okay. Uh, 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 the Escuela de, de Libre de Estudiantes in Madrid, which is where uh, um, Salvador Dali was in there, and uh, uh, Lorca, Federico Garcia Lorca, and uh, Juan Ramon Jimenez was in there uh, as the uh, instructor, and they, uh, they and from, from there, I had some free time, and I wanted to see uh, Andalusia. I wanted to see the Andalusian cities of Sevilla and Cordoba, and I've never seen those cities, so I went south to see from Madrid. I went south to see those cities. And in Sevilla, I started having dreams about uh, Morocco, a place I had never been to. And so um, I asked the guy at the desk how far away I was from Af North Africa. He said, it's right down the street. You're f f four hours away from here, from, from there. I said, mm-hmm. So I, I, uh, uh, he, he gave me the address of the, the bus, the station that goes to uh, further south to Al Jazeera, where you take the, the ferries to uh, Tangiers. And so I, the next morning, I just uh, took, went towards the taxi and went to the uh, but when I got to Spain, uh, the the money was still uh, pesetas. They were not uh, euros, uh, so mm -hmm. it was that period. And so um, I ended up uh, at the uh, San Sebastian bus terminal. Uh, I jumped on the bus, and uh, and then behind me, this beautiful Moroccan girl gets, gets on, and she looked Puerto Rican to me. Uh, <laughs> and so she just got on right behind me, and I said, wow, we. And so then finally, when there was a coffee break on the, uh, the bus was uh, two hours long, we got to Algeciras. And so the, during the coffee break, she talked to me in Arabic, thinking I was Arabic from my looks, you know? And so I said, no, no, no hablo Arabic. And so she started talking Spanish. And so we, we became friends and we had coffee, we came back on the bus, and then we sat next to each other. And then we've been together ever since. On and off, oh, we had a friendship that was a year, a period that I, I, was, I was in Puerto Rico. Right. And then finally I got back to her and, and we hooked it up then, you know. <clears throat> so what else about Morocco is it that, that pulls you here, do you think? Well, I like to, to be in areas where people are fused, where they're not, uh, let's say, monoculturally, uh, or that they're more part of nature, which nature to me is fusion, and architecture and music is fusion. And uh, the languages all seem to be fused to me also. And people are fused here also, like in the Caribbean, which is a mixture of people, ethnicities that came together and melted together. I don't like this term called multicultural, you know, because they seem to be multicultural, one sitting there, one sitting there, but they don't melt or communicate with each other. When you eat food, you put it in your mouth. You have the avocado in there, you have the red bean in there, you have the things that are native to the Americas, you have the things that are you know, uh, from other places, in, mm -hmm. in rice from China, and they all, when you taste them, you taste them all together. You don't separate one thing from the other. And when you look at somebody who's mestizo or mulatto, you see them all as one. And uh, and I like that also. And you, it, it's the same situation here. You have Berber dishes. You have, and the bakery here, like uh, the reposteria bakery, traditions are Berber and Arabic and French. So you have these. Uh, 
uh, pastry uh, shops that are full of all kinds of interesting things, you know. What languages do you speak in your, in your house? Oh, we speak various languages, French, Spanish, Arabic, and sometimes English. My daughter speaks good English. My son speaks a little English. And uh, the, the, the main language will be Spanish. It's the language that we can all uh, center on. And then uh, uh, to, to clear up meaning, you know, to clear up some words like kalamets, as they say here, kalamets means words. And uh, so our house is like crazy, you know, <laughs> French, Arabic, Spanish. In the morning is buenos dias, in the, you know, sabahel, buenos dias, you see. It's, it's so I like all that stuff and it's, 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 it's speaking so many languages. And I speak, yes, my worst language is French. I cannot get to French or something, but I can read a little bit of the French. And just like I, I can sp I listen to Portuguese people and understand them. And, and we went to the book fair, we heard some Italian women speaking, and they were speaking uh, Italian. I was understanding it, and so was Mina, who was understanding mm. into the Latin of the Spanish, you know. And I also did some research, and I found that Kona, Kona, which is where Kong, when I say cafe Kong, well, where does that con come from? Do you know that corner means the woman's genital in Latin? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Did you know that? Uh, uh, look it up if you want. So that's how, the, how you join, huh? No, that's, that, how, that's how you come together. That's how it, it's corner. Uh, what is coño? Oh, Yo, got uh, you got that now? Coño means yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, pussy. Uh, here they call it uh, tabuna. <laughs> and um, that's what. Uh, so if you wonder why Latinos are so hot, <laughs> they say, <laughs> ajos, ajos con habichuelas, ah, beans, rice and beans, ah, and uh, café con leche. leche. So if you say milk, we'll see, café, you know? <laughs> so that's, uh, I, the, the French came up with the word avec, uh, avec for width. But I think it's the only Romance language that does that. Uh, avec, uh, what do they do that do they do to avoid the, the coño, <laughs> <laughs> the con, you know? And um, uh, so uh, I do research like that to, to inform my poetry, to inform myself, you know? And um, Victor, we would understand that uh, if we hear your voice, we'd say, hey, this guy's got a Puerto Rican accent, you know? But uh, when you're speaking Spanish, do you have an English accent? I have an accent in Spanish, I have an accent in. Uh, in, in English, I, I'm, I'm accentual. And I, when I speak Darija, a little Darija, no, I have an accent too. Mm -hmm. I'm an accident, uh, accidental person, <laughs> accentual person. That's why we and uh, Andre Codresco read together. It was a night of accents over at the <laughs> poetry uh, project uh, that night we read together. Oh, yeah. That was just It, it was a, a night of accents. What was it like, uh, but, you know, when you... We met before the New York Post Cafe even got started. What was it like for you when that happens? When the, you know, you well, started? Well, I, I remember when the, the cafe was on 6th Street, and uh, I don't know, Ray Barreto was in there, wow. the musician, and, uh, and I, I remember Miguel Pinero reading a poem, and he had a, some cocaine in his, in his, and it was real coke, and he was doing coke, and he was doing this thing with cocaine, and and the whole, it was crazy, crazy times. And, and right around the corner was the New Rican village. Was that Edwin Figueroa? Eddie Figueroa. Eddie the Figueroa New was Rican there. Village. And there yeah. you could hear Latin jazz, you could hear uh, uh, Hilton Ruiz on piano, Ooh. you could hear uh, Totico and, and Patato, the Cuban uh, musicians, they were all in there. And you go right, right around the corner, you hear poetry at the cafe, you go around the corner. Yeah, some Latin jazz music, Hilton Ruiz on piano. It was fascinating, it was a renaissance, you know? Fascinating times there. And that hasn't been like that ever since. I mean, it just, the whole thing fell down after a few years of that. But it was great to have lived there and seen that. I felt so energetic those times that I was there. I was living in California actually at the time, but I would go and spend time with my mother who still lived on 11th Street. They still had to move back to the island. And they were, um, uh, interesting times, it's fascinating times, and to see all that was like magic, you know. Hey, Victor, could I ask you to read this part from the, the Vicente poem? The, the, the opening part? No, just read this part right over here. Well, why don't you just give us a title, though? 
is called Vicente Espinal, La Decima. Yeah. He's the inventor of the decima the form. Inventor of the decima form. Okay. Everything is so old. What? Are we the Arabs? The Moors? The Greeks? What are we, the Romans? The Berbers of such northern rise spread from Andalusia, the decimal of the popular song, embraced by the street and the mountains of the spark of the workers, the ceramic and leather people take to the taverns to wine and sing, the mestizo impulse of Mexico, de la sierra morena, cielito lindo, vienen bajando un par de ojitos negros, cielito lindo de contrabando. And that's a long song. So, Victor, that was an incredible time, the, the origins of the New York and Poets Cafe. Um, what was it that really came together then? What, what, what happened and what, what was gained by getting together and having an official place like that? Was there something that was lost? What was it answering? Well, I, I remember going to Miguel Algarín's house when he lived on uh, 6th Street, right across the street from the old Irish bar, and we see the old Irish guys in there drinking. And uh, we were, uh, Piñero was there, and Lucky Cienfuegos, remember him? Yeah, and sure. uh, different people, and uh, Miguel's sister was there, and uh, Irma. Irma. And uh, we would be there talking, sometimes reading poetry, sometimes singing, listening to music. And uh, was, uh, Miguel knew that he had to get out and open up something up. And there was get, just too many people in there. <laughs> get, 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 get the people into a club or something, you know? And so uh, that finally happened, and then that's when the whole thing started with the cafe. Uh, the um, uh, and, and that's when the New Newrican Village was opening up also at the same time, around the same period back in the, uh, what was it, 69? Something like that. Something like that. And so um, 69, 70, 71, that period, was an energy on the street. We would see each other. I would be walking with a wine glass from the uh, cafe, of course, every way, and go with the wine glass into the, uh, and leave the wine glass there, it didn't matter. Also, very quickly, the cafe began a, a platform and a voice for poetry, per se, of all groups, you know? And I think that's reflected in the, uh, the anthology of uh, New York Poets Cafe anthology that has people who are not New York and people who are New York, African Americans were in there. And so it, it was the whole, uh, thing that came into the tribe of the New Yorkans, you know, which accepted everybody, and it's a Caribbean form, it's a Caribbean uh, stance that we accept all the uh, cultures and all the foods come together as fusion culture, not not multicultures, which is popular with the progressives in the states, you know, it's fusion culture, and that's why I like that, and that's why I found that that movement very important. And I think that Miguel was broad-minded enough to include everybody, you know, and not just keep it uh, a New Yorkian thing. You know. That's right. That's why allowed voices from the New Yorkian Poets Cafe. You know, it, it was interesting that, that that book starts with the moment that the cafe reopened. The cafe was closed for the 80s for, for AIDS, crack, and gentrification. It was closed for the first time. And then when it reopened, that's when they really poured they, in they, all the. Did we open on, on Third Street or on Sixth Street? On Third Street. On, on Third they, Street. They relocated. Yeah. yeah. Well, to move from Sixth Street to Third Street to took that bar uh -huh. out of the Irish bar that you were talking about <laughs> and paraded it down the street like it was some kind of a, a circus celebration. <laughs> <laughs> no, just hands. hands, just lifted it up and carried it and put it down there. That, that took, you know, like under half an hour. <laughs> but it was Joe Papp who helped get that building for the uh, for the New Yorkans. You know, it was bought for a dollar from David Dinkins, the mayor at that point, you know? Yeah, yeah. Hey, you want to finish that poem for us, Victor? I'd love to hear it. Just yesterday, the trovador Isidro Fernandez, El Colorado de Aguas Buenas, let loose an ay, little laile, little laile, little laile, to echo through the mountains of Caguitas. I recognized I recognize instantly that he was blurring out a salutation in Arabic, a salute to the night, which is Leila in Arabic. Fill in, fill in Lil Leila Lala. 
hey la le lo le le la le la la le le commencing his song as our Arabic ancestors did in Al Andalus. Morocco, Akko. Unbelievable to sit here, wax in Marrakesh, listening to young guide Mohammed's cassette, which must be keeping everybody in the Hotel Chamel up. And after I'm finished listening, I'm to give it to the concierge, a skinny 18-year-old Ahmed with buzzbur haircut and scratched tenor voice that greets me each morning with... Alibaba, Fatima, Sahara, Tarfaya, commemorating my beard and my notion that the Moroccan Green March Army must have taken all the women, Fatima, to with them down to the Tarfaya Sahara outpost, of which more later, but now it seems as far away as Timbuktu, of which more later. And the cassette is... Jimi Hendrix, and I'm all ready to blast off into outer ladyland, but no, wait, this is pop, it's rock, it's, uh, it's, it's rock me baby, remember not by Jimi Hendrix, but Eddie Kendrix, oh, Morocco, Akko. So you try telling this to Mohammed, who's dancing and humming and sudsing his mouth with your toothbrush and toothpaste as he does every morning, a little ritual that he does when he settles into the hotel room with you. He shrugs and he laughs and he's listening to Jimmy or Eddie or whoever you call him. Just uh, music taped from an incredibly scratched record. Little jumps uh, for the needle that Mohammed anticipates as rhythms. Volume dips and variable speeds full of skips, slurs. American music, says Mohammed. Morocco, Akko. Next up is El Habib Luai, who we met up with in Essaouira, Morocco, a fishing town on the coast near Marrakesh. Essaouira is known for its argon trees, which produce an incredible oil and which is also fodder for the goats who climb to the highest vines to chomp the tastiest leaves. Author of Rotten Wounds Embalmed with Tar, El Habib Loai is a Moroccan poet at the impossible crossroads of ancient Tamazight orality and contemporary USA underground poetics. Ginsburg and O'Hara mix it up with Lala Aicha, who was so kind to us, never heard any insult. She was deaf like a stone. And Buslam, who passed away in his only Jalaba, inherited from his blind grandfather. Laoui has translated Bob Kaufman's The Ancient Rain, which is published in Baghdad. The name of the village where he was born is Tanwainan, a native village just like any indigenous village where people, says Luai, are united by their sense of belonging, traditions, and customs in the Berber language. It's rustic, it spends mostly agriculture and communal solidarity to administer and manage the local affairs, though officialdom nowadays interferes. Loy says he stays there simply because it's far from the madding crowds, closer to the land, and closer to the plants, or what remains of them, and the animals. It's secure, serene, and gives him a sense of hermetic stability to write and meditate. And they all speak Berber here. It's time to open our eyes and ears to a truly global poet, El Habib Luai, from Essaouira, Morocco. What are the traditions that you find in the in, in the Berber language? I think uh, Berber language, uh, like all the other languages that 
belong to indigenous and native peoples all over the world uh, is actually a language that has always uh, favored the oral expression of it, the spoken, you know, aspect of it, right? You know, um, so most of the people actually, the Berbers, Amazigh people, have always express themselves in an indirect way through the use of that language by creating metaphoric you know uh, uh, expressions that probably would save them time to go into details right well <laughs> that's what poetry wants to do poetry is a very condensed form mm -hmm. and uh, it carries each word carries its uh, meaning but a lot of other meanings going on too that's what makes it so so rich this mm -hmm. just the, the form of poetry the um, the Amazi language of course how many Berber languages are there there are three basic varieties three basic varieties yeah. but yeah. how many varieties of those varieties uh, I've heard there's as many as 60 Berber languages in Morocco is that an exaggeration <laughs> it's an exaggeration let's say that there are three basic okay. varieties right. but of course there are certain slight differences when it comes to accent and the way that you pronounce certain sure. things depending on the region and the area, the part of Morocco that you are originally from. Right. So um, I, I find it difficult to understand certain, you know, um, uh, variations in terms of pronunciation, right. but uh, still the, the body, the linguistic, you know, uh, jargon, the linguistic, the vocabulary is still common. You could make sense of it when you actually dissect it and notice, oh, this comes from the root is, let's say, uh, you know, uh, the root of this word is, um, you know, it pass means, uh, you know, slipped, I sleep. Uh, so you would actually find that there is a root for a word, even if it is used specifically in the south gotcha you have something in common so right. the, the root still remains you know fundamental do you speak this language at home amazig yes yeah sure yeah. and is that so would you consider it endangered um i think i think um, i wouldn't consider it endangered i think there is a revival Ah. of interest in Amazigh language and culture. It has been undermined for quite a long period of time, but somehow uh, probably it survived yeah. you know, because of its own people in the first place. And those are the oral traditions that yes. we're talking about that, yeah. that keep it alive. Undermined first by Arabic, then by French, mm -hmm. um, and of course Morocco is a place that has got many European languages that mix it up here. There are Spanish-speaking uh, towns and German-speaking mm -hmm. towns in Morocco because of the colonization, right. different colonizations. Um, so when you, you sit down to write, do you know what language you're going to write in? Um, I personally, I, I think I find it much more, I find myself uh, in a comfortable situation when I express myself in English. English? Yeah, probably because uh, it's very difficult for me to come up with certain expressions and um, rhetorical, you know, uh, formulations gotcha. in my own mother tongue. Right. This doesn't mean that I don't speak it very well. I speak it oh, very well. But, you <laughs> but the thing is, I can't be literary in my own mm. modern time. Oh, Somehow wow. it's very difficult. Okay. Uh, so, for instance, when I listen to the old Amazigh musicians, you know, creating their own song poems, spoken word kind of uh, poems, I, I say, oh, he must have invested so much effort and thought in all of these songs because it's not something that you can't easily come up with. It's not, it's not something that is spontaneous. It's something in which he, the singer, he or she, 
has invested so much effort looking wow. for the right word, yeah, yeah. looking for the rhyming word, right. looking for things, just wow. like in the classical poetry. Wow. Well. You know, this is very different uh, from many oral traditions mm -hmm. where there is a, a lot of spontaneity that's going uh -huh. on. Which, what is, uh, obviously, what is the, what is the written yeah. language called, the written alphabet? What's the alphabet? Tifinal. 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 It's gorgeous. Yes. Yeah. It's as crazy it's circles and, and all angles. These symbols, and all these different. They yeah. look like symbols. symbols. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, and they're phonetic. Each one has carries with yeah. the sound. Yeah. It corresponds to to an alphabet in yeah. the Latin. How many letters? I think we have 26, 27. Something you don't sing that. A, B, C, D in the... Frankly, I, you know, I, I, sorry, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't really learned it when I was a little boy. Ah. Because, as I said, it was under mine. Okay. We were not, we were not allowed to learn it at school. We, it was not available at the time. Right. It was not really a language that has been... Uh, valued by the educational system, yeah. so uh, I grew up not not really knowing how to read it. I spoke it without being able to to read it. I only started when I your education grew up. was yeah. in Arabic. Yeah, my education was in Arabic, French, and French. Ah. Pri my primary school, my secondary school, primary start. I started learning French when I was in the third grade, but I spoke Amazigh, Damazigh. But still, I didn't know how to read it. I didn't even know then that there is an alphabet that wow. actually presented. Right, or, right, you know, right. The, uh, right. But language. I, I was thinking when you said that English is your preferred language to go to, that that might have something to do with your incredible studies leading to translations of the beat poets. You know, like that seems like the beat aesthetic uh, has really kind of formulated you as a poet in some way. You yeah, know? I, I, I think, I think um, my interest in English came, you know, um, in high school. When I discovered that probably it would take me much effort to learn French with all the conjugation and everything. Hey, we got plenty of conjugation no, to English. No, it, it's not similar to French. <laughs> It's not as complicated. It's not as complicated as French. So, uh, in high school, I decided to switch to English because it was easier to learn. Okay. So I studied the classics. You know, I read uh, most of the classical classics. You know, classical literature, and I I was by nature probably because I come from, uh, let's say, an Amazigh working class family as somebody who comes from a small village where almost there is nothing, adobe houses, unpaved oh. the roads, the Unpaved, trees, yeah. the animals, right. uh, natural sources. Goats in the trees. Goats in the trees, <laughs> as, you, as you would say. That and only the, happens here in Esauera. Yeah, and then you I know? just, I said, there must be another way, you know, that we could probably raise the consciousness of people about how we live ah, and how important it is. Okay, so, so I came turned. that way so from turned. here yeah, from to into English. Yes. Rather, you yeah. know, when was it that you found out about the beats? I you... think uh, in my last year in high school, I I started to read almost all, you know, uh, any revolutionary poet that I could find, and during that time also translated some some. Um, some, uh, let's say, philosophical essays from English into Arabic to present for my philosophy class. And uh, while searching, you know, uh, through different archives, I mean, online and, and reading different books, I discovered that there was actually a movement called the Beat Generation Movement. And I associated them directly with the hippies because my father grew up as a hippie in Casablanca. You know, I always wondered why did he have long 
hair, you know, <laughs> and uh, wore this kind of strange and, uh, you know, uh, trousers of, and, you know, all the leather jackets and everything and the mustache. And, and I wondered, well, what, 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 what's going on How come here? my dad How is come? cool? How come? <laughs> now he looks different a little bit, you know. Oh. He, but then I asked him, I asked him questions about, you know, what, his life in Casablanca. And he said, this is what it looked like. All the people dressed in such a way. All the people, they they had long hair, and they had mustaches, and they smoked probably hash and keef, and you know uh, they liked music, they danced. So I think that 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 beat that beat spirit also was very much associated with the kind of life that my father led ah. at the time. So I went into the beats because there was something already in my family through my father ah, which was beat wow, and hippie wow so this is a poem from my second collection which uh, bob you know uh, i'm honored with his blurb <laughs> and uh, blurbed and uh, it's called um, uh, rotten wounds embalmed with tar my second collection and the poem is called they've got nothing but rainbow colors in blue skies I pass them every day, cycling at the outskirts of a shabby life. I pass them bent over in rows, picking the last ears of sweet corn, their forlorn shacks in the middle of cane breaks. I pass them every day, the Amazia farmers who fought to the last drop of blood, shitting salty tears over lands used by government officials in stiff suits. They got nothing except gut flies biting and buzzing over <laughs> their meek donkeys. No gods show up in their arid lands to help them with the harvest. They've got nothing except seven sheep skins on hard floors, the sultan's black and white photograph on blank walls, yeah. a gear bag of goat skin full of well water, broken jugs, hay stuffed rucksack pillows and clay plates and jillabas made of a 1001 patches i pass them every day the amazon farmers who fought for their native land their children rolling loose in crooked floors to the corners of clay rooms buttoned in cold their bones knitting shadows in the dark dreaming of pullovers raincoats and shoes no representatives ever come to ask how school is going. Their dreams are drawn in simness. No welfare checks or food stamps from phosphate revenues. I pass them every day. The Amazigh farmers who foot for the land. Their wives never throw anything away. And their children eat last week's grains rotting in plastic bags. They've got nothing but rainbow colors in blue skies. Oh. Beautiful. The Amazigh farmers of uh, Eswera and uh, the name of your little village? My little village is called Tingwainan. 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 You got it. You got it. And which is uh, a village where uh, Amazigh is spoken. Okay. I'm Bob Holman, and thank you for listening to Poetry is Bread. Subscribe to our podcast to get notifications of new episodes, or check us out at BoweryPoetry.com. The podcast is co-produced by Ram Devanini and Flavia Roja with Rataplax. The podcast series is funded by the Citizen Diplomacy Action Fund, which is sponsored by the U.S. Department of State with fundings provided by the U.S. government and implemented by Global Ties U.S., in partnership with the Office of Alumni Affairs and the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. Additional support from New York State Council on the Arts, Governor of New York State, Kathy Hochul, and the New York State Legislature. See ya.